You're listening to You First, the Disability Rights Florida podcast. On this special episode, we discuss the intersection of disability and reproductive justice in response to the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Hi there, I'm Maddie, co-host of the You First podcast, and welcome to our latest episode all about the intersection of disability and reproductive justice. Hey, I'm Keith, the other co-host of the podcast. Since the overturning of Roe versus Wade, we've seen huge repercussions for people's safety, health, access to medical care, and, and more. Huge changes, yeah. And we know that the overruling impacts people differently depending on who you are. If you have marginalized identities, you experience more barriers to health care and therefore more barriers to accessing abortion and other reproductive-related health care. To dive deep into how the overturning affects one marginalized community, the disability community, we invited four disabled activists on the show to discuss how this ruling affects them, the disability community as a whole, and other marginalized groups especially in in ways you may not have ever considered. That's right. It's important to bring an intersectional lens to these conversations in order to fully grasp what the repercussions look like after a ruling like this. I talked with Marenike Giwa Onaiwu, Rebecca Coakley, Keith Jones, and Heather Watkins about what this ruling means to and for the disability community. Please note that this conversation discusses heavy themes and references systems of oppressions such as racism and ableism, infanticide, abortion, and forced sterilization. Listen or read the transcript at your pace and always feel free to pause and make time to take breaks. Yes, the conversation is heavy, so please take care of yourself. And with that, let's move on to the episode. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. And before we get started, I'd like to have each of you introduce yourselves to the extent that you wish, whether that's your identities, education, work, what you do in your free time, anything that makes you who you are, please share it with our listeners. Thank you. I guess I'll jump in head first. My name is Keith Jones. Pronouns are he, him. I am the president and CEO of Soul Touch and Experiences, LLC, and I've been a disability rights activist for entirely too long. But thank you for having me on the show. Thanks so much for being here. Hi, everyone. I'm Marenna K. Giwa Onaiwu. Pronouns are she, her, hers, and they, them, theirs. I, let's see, I do a lot of things, (laughs) kind of freelance, essentially, but (laughs) the majority of it is related to, you know, disability justice work and so forth. I I am a parent. I live in the Southwest and I will soon have a doctorate, which seems like it's taken like all of my life. I am an INFJ, a vegetarian. And before J.K. Rowling lost her mind, I would say that I was a <laughs> Ravenclaw. But now I have to find some kind of other way to describe myself. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here, Marani K. I am also an INFJ and a Ravenclaw. So it's nice to have <laughs> fellow shared identities on this podcast. I'll go next. My name is Heather Watkins. I'm boss. I am a Boston based disability rights act- activist. I am a mother, a blogger, writer, caregiver, and a community builder. And I serve on a handful of disability related boards and projects. I am also a chocolate lover and a professional daydreamer. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am a Black disabled woman born with a form of muscular dystrophy who uses mobility aids such as canes on occasion, a manual wheelchair. And I also have a bedside companion called a ventilator to help assist with compromised respiratory muscles. And happy to be here today and join in this conversation to share perspective. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here, Heather. Hi, my name is Rebecca Coakley. My pronouns are she, her. I'm calling in from unceded Lenape territory here in New Jersey. I am a mom of three, a second generation disability activist. My mom ran a disabled student center at a community college. My dad ran a center for independent living. And myself and my parents and two of my three kids all have 
achondroplasia, which is the most common form of dwarfism. Like Marina Kay, I was totally a Harry Potter fan. I even have a constant <laughs> vigilance tattoo in protest of the previous administration on my wrist. And I've been contemplating what I do with it now. And I am a Slytherin and a Sagittarius. Awesome. Thank you all so much for being here. It's truly an honor to be able to share space with you all. I've looked up to y'all for a really long time. So it's really an honor to be able to talk with you about such an important topic. So yeah, so before we can jump into our discussion today, I think it's really important to lay the foundation and touch on why this conversation is not only an important issue for folks who can get pregnant, but especially for people with disabilities with and without the capacity for pregnancy. The overturning of Roe wasn't just about access to abortion, it's about access to privacy as well. So can some of y'all speak to a bit of this history and background regarding the intersection of disability and abortion, sterilization, medical ableism, sanism, institutionalization, anything related to that history? Well, that's a very loaded question. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Hopefully we can all kind of chime in and share. But I think that so for, a, you know, it depends on how far we can go back. But I think like in terms of when we look at, you know, various intersectionalities and we look at disability, race, gender, there's always been this element of control with regard to, you know, like our bodies. And, and so that, that's bodily autonomy in general, but in, in particular related to reproductive rights in terms mm -hmm. of who could injustice, who could raise their child versus whose child was going to be taken away be it, uh, you know, against your will? Would you be able to carry it? Were, were you, did you have the proper nutrition and means and healthcare to carry a child to term and or to raise the child? Mm -hmm. Did you have control over whether you conceived a child, you know, or not? And, you know, th some of the things of that nature. And then there's the aspect of, you know, we can go as far back as, you know, Buck versus is it Buck versus Bell. I, I never remember, I'm not saying it right. But there's a lot of different cases where we can look at people whose rights were, you know, who were forcibly sterilized because they were deemed as, you know, incapable of being able to care for a child. In some cases, you know, as young, you know, very young children whose parents were tricked into signing the, you know, the reproductive rights away. And it's just, you know, really awful. This was done quite a bit. And then we had the No Mas Bebe campaign and a number of other issues that have happened. And then even we could look into modern day with a lot of the guardianship agreements in terms of right, right. not having the autonomy to be able to have choices about their sexual lives and their ability to parent. And then there's stuff like custody rights. But I know there's a lot that people could share. So I'll stop now. This is Rebecca. I was going to jump in on what Marina Kay was saying. You know, as somebody with dwarfism, Within our community, we talk about the pride that folks have being able to trace the lineage of their dwarfism back multiple generations. Mm -hmm. And was talking recently to a good friend of mine who was talking about how he had found out, well, A, people with dwarfism and people with disabilities were being bought and sold across carnivals and circuses. We all know that. But that he found out that his great grandmother was forcibly bred. She was, you know, she had something like 15 pregnancies. And, you know, if the child was born without a disability, they killed it. If the child was born with a disability, they sold it. And, you know, it's part of the history of our community that we don't often talk a lot about. But as Marina Kay was indicating, just that whole conversation around bodily autonomy is one that it never went away for folks with disabilities. I mean, I had my daughter in 2013 and was laying on the operating room table when the anesthesiologist said to my OBGYN, well, while you're down there, why don't you go ahead and tie your tubes? People like her don't need to have more kids. Wow. Um, you know, and we continue to watch this, particularly in the prison system. You know, most recently we saw, I think it was the state of Tennessee, offered a year off of people's sentences if they chose to be sterilized. And let's be real, they were specifically talking about African-American inmates. So you really can't have this conversation and do it its due diligence without taking into account the nexus of race and class and gender and disability. Right. Thank you for that. This is Keith. I think the interesting aspect is they talk of, as, as, a, as a man with a disability and talking about reproductive rights, we have to talk about the asexual aspect of the way they perceive people with disability or a mm. community. First, we're not seen as sexual beings with any kind of emotion and or desires. Secondarily, we should, how dare we want to 
perpetuate more people like you in this society and its community. And I think the history, particularly for those of us who are in the diaspora, you were, if you were born in Mississippi, you know, going back to my great grandparents, if I had come along then, I would have been tied to a stake. It used this alligator bait. So that's the history of disabled slaves not being useful in the field. And then you move that forward to here. We're in 2022, and we were talking about the pandemic, about, again, the devaluation of people's lives solely based upon their human condition. So even to get to the question of do we have the right to reproduce, the question before we even get to that is, are we even human in these contexts of these discussions, which is ironic because the people who claim to make the decision about our humanity are moving in a very inhumane way. Mm. So I think those are the kind of challenges and issues we have discussing. How do we get reproductive rights if you don't even see me as a human? Right. And you can have that cognitive dissonance between my ability to be seen as a man or a woman, never mind whether or not my physical autonomy is the way that I see my gender. So if mm-hmm. I'm transgender, how can I do that? If you're saying sterilization is the best option for you, this goes to education. This goes to the school, the prison pipeline. This is underemployment. This is tragic health care. They never ask me about my health care, male health. Never mind the fact that the stereotype about men never going to the doctor. If I go to the doctor, they don't even see me as a real patient. So those are the kind of things I think in those kind of discussions, particularly in the medical field, the social field, and even within the disability community with the internal ableism and the racism and the classism, we have yet to even come to the conclusion that we are all worthy of even making that choice. That's what Mrs. Heller, I was just thinking about that, about, you know, seeing the devaluation of disabled folks and bodies and withholding the information, right? regarding reproductive health care and not seeing us as sexual beings, people, you know, um, uh, you know, involved with any kinds of sexual activity, pleasure, beauty, kink, right? Any of those things that revolve mm-hmm. around choice. And listen, and let's consider even the structural access, right? If you can even get into a doctor's office where medically accessible equipment is, right? Where you can have a, a mobility aid that can right. do a complete yeah. revolution in the office, right? Do you have enough room for that? Do you have, are you encountering mm-hmm. right. medical personnel who are culturally aware and sensitive and can provide that responsive kind of care, right? So all of those things, because they don't consider you someone who is, would even conceive of trying to conceive. So you, you're not even given all of any, all of the information that your non-disabled counterparts and peers would be getting. So that's the initial setback, right? And so I'm just thinking about all of that as each person was was faithful in, in, in regards to access. Definitely. Yeah, I'm hearing like themes of how people with disabilities and their access to necessary health care and autonomy and their own decision making is really like impacted and entirely controlled by folks that don't hold those same identities as them. And I think that history, and like you mentioned, that history and those oppressive forces on folks with disabilities are still present today. These things that you're talking about as having happened in the past are what, you know, non-disabled folks or people that aren't familiar with disability-related issues and topics and conversations, they don't necessarily realize that these things that are supposedly archaic to them are real and happening still today. And on the day that Roe versus Wade was overruled, it reopened the conversation about what autonomy is to everybody and what it means to have autonomy of our body and choices. And that autonomy at the end of the day isn't awarded to disabled folks in the same way as their non-disabled peers. Even while abortion and pregnancy related health care was more protected. Mm-hmm. So can you speak a bit to what that might look like in present day now that Roe 
has been overturned and how that could further impact the disability community. I know some of y'all touched on your experiences before Roe, but now that Roe has been overturned, what does that look like to you? How are you kind of, you know, engaging in understanding what that looks like? Sure. I was just going to say that um, there's an article that came out not long ago, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, that actually highlighted some of this, what, how some of this has occurred, has happened. Because I'm here in Texas, which unfortunately started this horrific, mm-hmm. you know, landmine toward what we, you know, what we're dealing with now nationally. And there was a story about a, a husband and wife, and the wife was disabled, and they were ha- expecting their first child. And they, you know, sh- they opted to bypass the screenings because they said they didn't care if their child has a disability or not. They were just really happy that, that their little girl was on the way. And then it turned out that, you know, her her water broke really early. She was compromised. And, and this happened very early in the pregnancy. I think she was like 24 weeks. It was not or, or 16 weeks. It was very early to where the pregnancy was not viable. And so they tried to see if they even if they had her on bed rest, if their child would be able to survive. Mm-hmm. And so they made the heartbreaking decision that they were going to have to, you know, end the pregnancy for the health of the mother and in the child and in the state of Texas, because a heartbeat had been detected, that wasn't allowed. Mm-hmm. So even though they had proof of, you know, illness, infection, they would not allow her to, as long as they could, you know, to, to hear a heartbeat, they would not allow any, in a, regardless of what her obstetrician said and everything else, the, the hospital refused to let anything happen. She was discharged, had to go home and contract, like her infection had to worsen to the point mm-hmm, where it was mm-hmm. just uh, this is horrific spell, smell. And to where they finally admitted her and then forcibly, you know, were allowed to had an ethics committee meet to allow her to to, you know, terminate her little girl. Mm. And it was just traumatizing and heartbreaking for this family. And and it was just heartless. And so, it, you know, there's I just think about this and how this could be not could be will be people's daily reality. Right. This is Keith. I think one of the things when you talk about the Murray Kate and going back to what Heather and Rebecca had said earlier, as a father with three daughters. When the decision came down, I, you know, to be flat about it on Black in America, I kind of was like, I don't know why y'all are getting married now. They've been at this for 50 years. Mm-hmm. They've been trying to do this for 50 years. They never wanted this to happen. So it's from the social construct, I was upset because I'm the father of daughters. And I, you know, it, we are irrational when it comes to protecting our children. So I just was like, I don't know if I have enough bail money. If somebody wants to say something crazy, right? I got you, Keith. I got <laughs> you. I'll put some okay. in. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's up. Okay, I got you. I got you. But it also was in this body autonomy discussion, particularly when it comes to the Roe v. Wade decision and decision making, there is no discussion of males in the process. There's no discussion of that, right? And so how do you carry that psychological burden of, okay, now, as on this side of the equation as a man, I don't have the control. If she walks up, wakes up tomorrow and says, I don't want this baby, my emotions are whatever, but I do not have that control. Mm -hmm. How do you live with that kind of trauma or that kind of mental baggage? And so it was, for me, the duplicity was as a parent seeing this and saying, how can I give my daughters the free and fair access to anything in this country? I mean, particularly because they're black girls. So it wasn't like you were behind the eight ball before. Now you're not even on the pool table. So I guess for me, you know, I guess now it's that, I guess it's you know, trying not to be too, you know, pessimistic, but it was this great white woman awakening, like, Lord Jesus, they coming after us now. Mm-hmm. And, right? and so I guess that, that kind of weight is what, you know, I'm hoping we can push past that, but I don't know. Yeah. And Marana Kay brings up, you know, a really important kind of side effect that's happening, you know, the intersection of race and disability and gender and how these conversations are not inclusive at all. It's very white women centric. The folks that are being covered in the news as far as protesters and speakers and folks that are going to be impacted the way the bills and laws are written are not, you know, comprehensive to the full effect that these 
folks in large band communities are going to be impacted by this. So, you know, Marina Kay was talking about the fact that now in a post-Roe world without abortion and proper medical care protections for things like miscarriages or ectopic pregnancies, we're already seeing complications of difficult pregnancies putting people's lives at risk. So how does this like medical ableism and Roe intersect? How does a pre- row turning and now post row world kind of collide and how do we still advocate for accessible and equitable health care for folks this is rebecca in our in the dwarfism community when both parents have the same kind of dwarfism it ends in a terminal pregnancy a quarter of the time and so my parents have i'm the only one that made it in our family my parents had two babies before me that had double dominant diagnoses and one after me And so it is like, it is just a fact of our culture that it's something that we often talk about. You know, I think the lens on this that folks aren't often thinking about when they're like, oh, you can just go to another state is, you know, A, let's, you know, because of Hyde, people with disabilities that are on Medicaid cannot use their Medicaid dollars to be able to access this. Mm -hmm. B, we know that for the average you know, household with a person with a disability, we're talking about a, a minimum of $17,000 of additional annual expenses mm-hmm. you know, for that individual that are not covered by insurance. So you know, if you're having to travel out of state, do you have accessible transportation if you need it? Do you have somebody to come with you? you know, what does that mean? What does that look like? And even if you do, as we saw in the case of the woman who reached out to Planned Parenthood in New York, who was a wheelchair user, she was still denied an abortion because they literally said, we don't know what to do with you. You know, the existing infrastructure wasn't accessible to begin with. And, you know, I think I give a lot of love to Lori Bertram Roberts, who runs the Mississippi Reproductive Freedom Fund, Mm -hmm. who is a queer, black, fat, femme, disabled chick mama who has been talking about this specifically in the reproductive justice space for decades. Mm -hmm. Both her and Renee Bracey Sherman have been talking about the impact on women with disabilities, you know, and have largely been ignored when bringing this into the conversation. But I think it is one of those things where, you know, people don't like to showcase us on this issue, meaning people with disabilities, because we make it too real for them. Mm. And we don't have the luxury of not having this conversation. Yes. And they also don't like to showcase us because we are their excuse that they use to try to say why they should have reproductive justice in the first place. Like, who wants a kid like us? This is Heather. I was just thinking about certain examples in terms of ectopic pregnancy. I had an ectopic pregnancy and I didn't know that. So many of us are followed by high risk, you know, in the category of high risk pregnancies. And it was confirmed that I had that I was pregnant, but after having an you know ultra a transvaginal ultrasound, it wasn't detected, and I was sent home. So I had concerns. I'm talking about it, and mm. I'm still being sent yeah. home. So I'm thinking about all of the disabled, you know, BIPOC folks who have extra concerns, but they're hushed away because that believability factor or the pain management or you know drug seeking from certain you know other questions that people have regarding their bodies at that time. Long story short, I was. After I was sent home and I was told to come back the following week, I, my, my pregnancy ruptured in my fallopian tube and I was rushed to the uh, emergency mm-hmm. room and in, into emergency surgery. And I lost my left fallopian tube and I could have lost my life. So I think about that was before, you know, the overturning. And I'm in Massachusetts where the governor has said, has vowed that, you know, abortions will always be safe and legal. But I think, you know, so many other states, you know, now obviously now don't have that option. And again, and then we're talking about the believability factor and forcing people to endure an ectopic pregnancy, which will cost you your life because you cannot survive a, you know, an ectopic pregnancy without that, uh, you know, remove as I, as I understand it. It's just, it's so infuriating and frustrating. Yeah, I'm hearing the frustration in y'all's voice and just like the deep rooted, just kind of distrust and lack of care from the folks that are in charge of the decisions and have the power to make these things more accessible and better for anybody who can get pregnant or people who would be impacted 
by someone getting pregnant. And it just seems that every step of the way from advocates to doctors who have marginalized identities, whether that's a racial background or a disability or the people themselves, like Heather just shared, like who is valued, whose voice and what community is believed, legitimized, taken seriously, I think is a really important thing for folks to keep close in their minds when we continue having this conversation. Um, And I want to go back to something that Marenike brought up, which is kind of this escape clause when it comes to abortion. It's like an abortion loophole, for lack of better words, when people are talking about abortion. And then suddenly we start debating disability and what quality of life means for someone once they're born. And, you know, we recognize that this is ableism. This is ableism in action. And people without disabilities think people with disabilities have less quality of life. And this idea causes people who could potentially give birth to someone who has screened to have a disability or likely to have one to terminate that pregnancy just based on that. So how does this impact the disability community in both big and small ways? And how does this gap in conversation about abortion still exist to consider abortion more aptly or more seriously when a child is potentially going to be disabled? Well, this is key. That goes to, again, what everybody who has said it. It's who's value, right? So if you talk about the arc, you know, and that thing Lorena he talked about at the beginning, you know, how far back are we going to go? We don't even have to go that far back considering right. that the ugly laws, I was six when the ugly laws came off the books. So, wow. you know, so the, I'm, you know, I'll be 53 in about a month and a half. So it's one of those things when you talk about from a perspective of who's valued, We have to remember that the value in this society is based upon how much can you do with your hands? How, Mm. you know, how much can you be, how much work can you do? You know, if you talk about, you know, agricultural work, you talk about migrant work, you talk about labor, particularly again, using that, the thing that I said in the beginning, if you weren't valued as labor, you're not valued. So Mm. how do we, how are we still skipping over this discussion? We are still having this discussion because People still look at us and go, oh, my God, you're such an inspiration. I don't know what I would do if I woke up like you. I'm like, well, damn it, I'm glad you didn't wake up like me because you <laughs> suck. But it's, that, it's the discussion of, of this is the morality thing because people right. fall back on their religion. They fall back right. on their culture. They fall back on their training. So how do the conversation will change once we start valuing humanity, regardless of how we show up. Right. You know, Keith, I want to build on what you said, because it really informed a lot of my grant making when I came to Ford, like when I'm coming to a foundation in the middle of the pandemic. I don't know about y'all. Actually, I can assume that I know where y'all land on this, but I know I was sick to death of watching non-disabled people, non-disabled doctors on TV talking about the pandemic. Right. And, you know, when I came to Ford, one of the things I wanted to fund, and we actually just launched it yesterday, is Docs with Disabilities, a national membership organization for healthcare professionals with disabilities. And it was because of, you know, conversations that I had with my OBGYN who still holds it down for me so much and is still in DC and I don't care. I'm in Jersey. I'll hop the train to go see her <laughs> yeah. um, because you all know, like you yes. have a good right. doc. She's my medical yes. home yep. for everything. Yes. And, right. And, you right. Know, I've given her, na- her name and number out to everyone in the disability community. So getting an appointment's hard now, but like in conversations with her, it really struck me. And even in talking to other friends of mine, particularly doctors who came through COVID and have now either frankly acquired PTSD because of the COVID experience or are now self-identifying, you know, and then seeing the leadership of folks like, you know, yeah. Andrea Dalzel, Justin Bullock, mm-hmm. Fra- Dr. Ferrami Okunlami, uh, Javier Lopez, and so many others, and being like, no, these are voices that matter. And we need to, part of how we shift this conversation is like an infiltration agenda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do we help support doctors and nurses and genetic counselors with disabilities? Like it was when I had a, when I had a sonogram with my youngest, who was a lovingly referred to him as boringly average (laughs) because he's not disabled. When they kept, I kept the the sonographer was like, oh, everything is measuring normal. And I was like, but his arms and legs are so long. (laughs) And they were like, no, that's on point. I'm like, Emma, 
And I was like, am I fucking a spider? Like, what am I going to do? And I was like, what kind of life can this child have? Like, I'm like, his son grew up around president, or his brother grew up around presidents. I'm like, what kind of job can a kid like this have? I was like, is he just going to be around to, like, be a duster? Can I have him go work retail and hang up clothes? <laughs> like, you know, and it was, and my OB is, like, on the floor dying. And is like, Becca, stop it. You're killing me. And the stenographer was like, Oh, or it was like, oh my God, like, oh, you're kidding. And I was like, yeah, I'm totally kidding. But what am I going to do with this kid? He's going to eat me out of house and home. <laughs> and <was> like, <laughs> I was like, the superior dwarf baby is more cost effective <laughs> than you average babies. But like we had like thinking about how do we change the conversation? How do we infiltrate where it's happening? And like, you know, I've been actually really pleased to see the growing, like we saw Disability organizations for the first time really issue statements on the dollops yeah. kids. Like, mm-hmm. you know, because, and I honestly, I'm also going to acknowledge that. Do you know why it happened? Because we uh-huh. have women in leadership. Yeah. Like, yeah. Little People of America, my organization, decided we were going to have a town hall where we were going to listen to everyone's complex feelings about the issue. Because it's run by men. Yeah. You know, and so I, I do think that there is... Like, how do we challenge the structures within our communities and how do we build new power structures to facilitate right. how we have these conversations? I was just thinking about what Rebecca was saying, challenging people. But then we have people in leadership like the VP who was just talking the other day, right? And giving, you know, pronouns and visual descriptions. And you have people in Congress making fun of that. And I'm thinking of, you know, the tweets I've seen you know, talking about why is she giving visual descriptions and using pronouns. And that was on, you know, on, the, on July 26th, the Americans with this act day, you know, the crossing, talking right. about reproductive right. rights right. and right. specifically Roe v. Wade overturning and how it will affect disabled persons. So we can have all these conversations and have people in leadership. And at all of these different levels, we have to be dual purpose. Speaking and moving and, you know, constantly, you know, trying to get the message across, but fighting people on the same, this sort of lateral kind of level, right? We're trying to, it always feels like we're being thwarted in some way. Mm -hmm. And so I was just thinking about Mm -hmm. the work that is continuous, that doesn't have to be so hard if you can get these people to understand, like, recognizing you and your you know, in all of our glorious granularity, as I like to say, going back to that, valuing us as a whole. <laughs> and so it's just so infuriating and tiring and frustrating. Right. And, and it just seems like it's unceasing. I just wanted to add that in really quickly. So some of you have mentioned having kids. Some of you are parents. Some may want to be parents in the future. Can you talk a little bit about your experience and treatment as parents with disabilities and how the overturning of Roe may impact you and how you see this issue potentially in a new light now? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just giggling because as a parent, there's, I was, you know, earlier when you talking about the kids being, you know, messy and things like that. As a father, it changes my perspective. As a son, it changes my perspective. I mean, even though as a Black man in this country, understanding how Black women and women of color, indigenous women have been treated and how it seems that the only time those fears about their concern, their health care, is only tied to whether or not black women are involved. Mm. And so the frustration point for me as a parent raising daughters was and is, how do I instill body positivity? How do I get them to dodge colorism? How do I get them to dodge misogyny, massage the wall? And then on top of that, live in a society that literally is saying the thing that you exist in, you can't have control over. So, it, so as a parent, particularly as a parent with a physical disability, nobody ever thinks that those are my kids anyway. Hmm. Like I'm completely dismissed from the entire discussion. And going back to, because when we went in to find out that we were having twins, which is crazy, they were like, they, but we went in and they, their mother laid on the table to do the ultrasound. The doctor looked at me and said, so what the hell happened to you? Like mm. that's, you know, and so those kind of encounters are, you know, so when I look at this, 
post row era, it's not really post row. It right. has always been this way. And right. it's just now it's more, more prevalent, more pronounced. And the people who have access to megaphones are talking about it. But I think of the parent, my concern is that we're in the state where they've taken sex ed out of schools. They're taking books out of school. They're not talking about, they're saying in Texas that slavery was involuntary relocation. Yes. So if we're having those kind of discussions. How do I talk about having my daughters make healthy reproductive choices and just being able to understand that your sexuality is okay? Right. You know, so that's yeah, the challenge. Yeah, it's such a... There's such a focus now on such a white centric movement now that the now that Roe has been overturned. But that wasn't the situation in reality for so many people, like you mentioned. And just because this is now a reality for more folks and questioning people's access to health care and equitable health care, these have been issues for generations and since the birth of this country. So acknowledging that this, not just how it's impacting us now, but just how it has always been from the displacement of indigenous okay. folks till today. So I wanted to give space to other folks who might want to talk a little bit about their experience as a parent with a disability and how, you know, being a parent with a disability has been for you. This is Heather. I just think about how so much of our decisions as uh, disabled persons are side-eyed and second-guessed, and that would extend to parenting as well, or choosing to parent, and even with our, within our own families. Mm -hmm. So even if you have a partner who is supportive, let's suppose if you break mm -hmm. up, I mean, I was taken to court, you know, regarding custody rights, and he was trying to use my disability as the sole factor of gaining custody. No other evidence, you know, wow. of, you know, mm -hmm. mistreatment of my child or, you know, neglect or anything like that. But like, oh, I think she'd be better off with me. You know, luckily in my case, it was thrown out twice. Mm -hmm. But I think about all of those kinds of things where, you know, you need a lot of support. And sometimes that doesn't come from, you know, your own network. You have to seek out, you know, outside network and the sources to support you in things like tips and resources and, and, you know, life hacks and frustrations. And so that, you know, my experience as a disabled parent was, you know, fraught with so much fear and anxiety because I was trying to keep myself physically safe and also making sure that my, I didn't make any quote unquote mistakes raising my child because I knew there was going to be that scrutiny. Oh, we do. You couldn't do it, you know, because I had a physical disability. Mm -hmm. Luckily, none of my fears came to manifest. Mm -hmm. But it was just, had I, you know, been supported across the board in that way, or had a support system that was composed of other disabled parents, then I it could have alleviated some of that internal terrorism, right? And looking at myself through a non-disabled gaze mm -hmm. instead of one that was more meaningful and better informed from other disabled persons and parents at that time. So that's why I, I'm really glad that all of us here are on the advisory board of the National Research Center of Parents with Disabilities because that was sorely needed back then, that kind of support. And, you know, we all come from diverse backgrounds and have different disabilities. And that has informed not only the way I, my own self-awareness, but my advocacy skills as well. So that has been my parenting experience. And I'm I don't think I would would have been the kind of person I am today or the parent I am without having had my disability because it, it's contributed to the way I see mm -hmm. the world, my my worldview, my personal perspective, and just other people in general. I am a more mindful person and have those kinds of intentions because I wanted to build a, a blueprint for my child, not for them to be a clone, but kind of just have that nod like my mother, this is what my mother's doing. This is her example. And I feel confident to go out and, and sort of conquer the mm -hmm. world in her, in the way she sees it. So that has been my parenting experience. I would just say like this conversation is really radical in itself for the disability community. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, generations prior to ours didn't have the ability, like most folks weren't parents. 
most folks are fighting to get out of, you know, institutions, their families' basements, you know, we're dealing with different forms of incarceration. And, you know, I remember talking to somebody once and then being like, yeah, I always wanted to be a mom, but like, I was, you know, fighting to be able to get a job. So that didn't happen. And I remember even when my husband and I started dating and I brought him to, I brought him down to Florida to a meeting of the Florida Youth Council. And because we had planned, I had planned to take him to Disney World for his birthday. And he came in the room at one point and like brought me coffee or something and then left. And all the young women in the room were like, who was that? And I was like, oh, that's my boyfriend, Patrick. And they were like, like, it was like the needle went off the record. They're like, you have a boyfriend? Wow. Like, are yeah. you going to get married? Like, what's that like? And that be, and that's like literally like taking a beat and like having a conversation being like, no, you have the right to be like, you have yeah. the right to be in a relationship. You have the right to find someone to love. Like this is, and they all talk about, you know, how like they watch us date, they watch us get married, they watch us have kids and how that shifted their expectations. And I mean, I remember meeting all three of the people I'm on this, I'm on this call with. And the small talk we had at the beginning where it's like, oh my gosh, these kids are driving me crazy. Like, I might kill these children. Totally kidding. There's no violence in this household, you know? And as Heather said, that's also, like, you have to make that clarification because we know in over 20 states, you can lose custody of your child solely on the basis of a disability diagnosis. So you have to be at a heightened state of insecurity and preparation for, like, how you handle things than non-disabled parents. But this is Heather again. I just... And throw in the fact that, you know, in so many communities of color, we live interdependently. So in my household, not only was I raising my daughter, I took in my nephew who has an intellectual disability. He came through by the by way of a kinship placement through the Department of Children and Family Services. And then at the same time, I was caregiving for my father for the last 11 years of his life. So each one of us was, you know, helping each other out. To, and relying on one another to get our needs met. So while I was managing my father's health care, he was helping me out physically, maybe, you know, when we go grocery shopping or, you know, helping uh, around the house and things like that. Each person had a role to play. And I think, you know, it's just something that needs to be highlighted when we're talking about people of color and the complexities of having a disability. It's all of these dual roles you play in terms of home management. And your own health care, right? So many of us are in need of care, caregivers and community builders all at once. And nobody really thinks about it in that way. And having a disability is contributing to the community. And I think it's due in large part to not seeing those depictions across the media landscape. So when Rebecca talks about her, you know, dating experience and people asking her, her those kind of inane questions, would it? Would they ask them less if they right. saw that, you know, on, you know, in media, in, in, in meaningful ways where we're running households and running, you know, board meetings and, you know, we're party goers and planners. And then you see us with storylines mm-hmm. that are fully developed because the writers right. are disabled. And so, they're, you know, they're informing those storylines. Right. So I just wonder about all of that stuff. And I just want to add also, you know. How would we have seen ourselves in terms of budding self-awareness at young ages if we were taught about this right. in high school? I right. mean, in grade school, taught about, you know, disabled icons like Fannie Lou Hamer, like Sojourner Truth, like Harriet Tubman, like Brad Lomax. How would that impact mm-hmm. young minds and, you know, in building their own self-awareness and newly disabled persons, right? So I think about all of those things and how they impact the way we conceive right. and conceptualize disabled persons in their entirety. Heather, I think that's a really great transition. I know we've kind of touched on education and access to equitable education, information about our bodies and sexuality and education when it comes to being informed about what that can look like when we become adults and how people with disabilities have been denied the same sex education and information about their bodies as their non-disabled peers. And I feel like, like Keith mentioned, there's this kind of culture war going on right now, not just about sex education, talking about our textbooks and anti-racist theory. And there's all of this compounding all at the same time in our present day. And how 
so I just want to kind of turn the conversation to talk a little bit about how has this conversation about sex ed and protection left disabled folks out in the past? And how can we kind of shift that narrative to protect our youth with disabilities and educate them about consent and protection and violence and healthy relationships and show them the representation that they need in order to have healthy, loving partners, relationships, whatever in the future? I really agree with everything that's been shared thus far. And I really wanted to kind of hone in for this question on what I was already discussed about the representation, mm-hmm. right. because I think that it's hard for someone to to want to be what you can't see, what you don't know exists. Right. right. And yes. And with regard to disability, either there's the infantilization where we're just, you know, right. you know, adult, you know, adult bodies, but we're really kids inside and we mm-hmm. need to be protected or we have no desires or interests. Or there's the flip side and we're just really wanting and just You know what I mean? Just like, you know, like, so it's like there's no in between. It's like these extremes. And I think that I think about movies that I saw growing up that the few that depicted anyone who was who had a disability as being in a relationship or being a parent. And I think about the, you know, I think about like the, you know, a lot of first of the time, first, a lot of these were played by people who were non-disabled. But aside from that part, which is a conversation in and of itself. There were situations like the other sister, where the mother was discouraging her daughter to date another person right. who was had ID because she thought he, quote unquote, couldn't take right. care of her daughter. Right. And then there were things like I am Sam, where basically it was a kind of a, a you know, transactional sex arrangement between him and, and, you know, someone who had, you know, unstable housing, you know, or things of that nature. And so I just feel like. Um, or it's a situation where there's like this kind of like savior right. situation where it's this person who falls for the disabled person with the right, heart right. of gold. Right. It's just <laughs> disgusting. I'm like, we mm-hmm. are just like everybody else. We've got jerks among right. us. We've got plenty <laughs> among us. we got good people. And we need to be depicted as such. You can't, you know, there's if people have any wonder why there's a lot of confusion amongst youth, you know, today in terms of disabled and not in terms of their sexuality or what is acceptable and what is not is because of the mixed messages that we're sending in society and the lack of representation of humanity overall. I just think mm-hmm. of how powerful it would have been for me growing up. Like when as an adult, it's almost like the like I started to see things of the real world. Right. I started to realize, oh, wow, this teacher had a hearing aid or this person worked, you know, had a cane and they made it seem like it was like a cool thing, like for style, but it was for mobility. Like because of ableism, people, you know, downplayed these things. And if only people could have seen the other people around them who have disabilities as well, how right, rich it would have made right. everyone's lives, whether they had a disability or not. One of the things that um, if I dated, they used to go, ooh, you should date her because she's in a wheelchair just like you. Wait, wait, but I don't like her. Like, I just, like, yes. like, and she don't like, come on, baby, I'm kind of hot. I need a, you know, like, <laughs> but it's that, like, but it's that, but it's that what you just said. It's that, like, you know, going back to how do you, I, did, I never saw myself on TV. My mother told me, you know, about two mm-hmm. months ago, the, the couple of years ago, we had a discussion where they asked her what was her expectation of me. And she was like, you going to get, you going to graduate high school, graduate college, get the hell out of my house. And they sent her to a psychologist and a psychiatrist because they thought she was unstable. <laughs> and then when I hit puberty, yeah. I guess they thought, they were like, oh, you know, mm-hmm. it'll pass. No, it won't. I like what I like. And so, but you were never seen as having <laughs> those. And I'm, I, even with kids, people go, oh, you have children? Wow. How did that happen? I'm like, I really don't have the energy to explain the nuances of this. But if at this stage of the game, we're still asking people with disabilities to impress us with just being human. My frustration is that we have allowed people to intellectualize their hate and their bias and then actuate it through policy and weaponize it through discrimination. Mm -hmm. That's my problem with not being able to give my kids, my daughters, my son, those kind of you know, be proud about your body. Be proud of who you are. Love who you love. Irrespective of that. But if you add a disability to it, people will say, well, maybe you don't really know what you're getting into. And that, I think that for me is, is the frustration about teaching sex ed, teaching good things on TV, having these discussions about what is it like to be a child with a disability who wants to transition to the gender that they feel they are. 
And then you have to go through that whole process of where people actively try to tell mm-hmm. you that your emotions are not what they are. And that's what's so maddening about all of it. Keith, this is Rebecca. I was laughing about you. Like, oh, you need to date that person because they're disabled too. Like, I mean, to me, like, I I remember in junior (laughs) high, there was another girl with a disability in my school who was a total B, not a nice person. It's still not a nice person. (laughs) And I remember literally the principal, the vice principal, the counselor, and like three other people calling me in and being like, you should be friends with her. (laughs) And I was like, but she's not nice. And they're like, but she's not nice because, you know, maybe she hasn't had friends before. And I was like, that's not my job. Right. <laughs> like, and to me, like hearing you even talk about that, I mean, it is, as Marina K and right. other were talking earlier, it's that additional extension of bodily control. Like, it's a mm-hmm. way that society tries to control us, you know? And I can tell you, like, when it comes to the sex education conversation, I yep. make my 11-year-old son really uncomfortable because right. we all know 11-year-old boys. They're all about like, can I shock my mom? Uh And so like, he'll walk in the room and be like, penis. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, so let's talk about it. Want to talk about testicles too? Let's go. (laughs) And he gets so, and he's like, no. And he'll like run out the room. And I was like, no, we're going to have this conversation. I grew up in San Francisco in the early 80s at the height of the HIV epidemic. I watched friends of my parents die. And like, we are not going to grow another generation of like, like sexual yeah. ignoramuses right. like we are going to make sure that you understand how your body works and like so every time he says he'll like you know try to shock me with something be like hey mom what's 69 mm. and i'm like okay let's talk about this <laughs> turns bright red and runs out the room and i'm like look this is never going to be a space where like it's going to be awkward i will have the conversation with you because yeah. you will be informed you know but we ended up actually we just bought a whole uh, a couple of different books for him And I like put them on his bed and I was like, all right, before you come to me with your next question and try to shock and all me, take a look at the books and let's have a conversation. But it's because we know that Uh our kids won't get it in school. Uh And we know Uh that our kids, I mean, from, and as people with disabilities, we're taught that we don't have the right to consent from the time that we're little kids when it comes to doctors, when it comes to teachers, oh, make sure, you know, you're going to have this person wipe your butt for you. You're going to have this person make food for you. Like, do you have a, do you have a decision-making like voice in those conversations? No, often you don't. And so how do you grow that skill set? And how do you grow that skill set in our young people to be able to be like, no, if you don't like the person who cuts up your food, you can fire them. Mm -hmm. But what are the consequences if you do? And how do we have those very real consent conversations as early on as possible? That's so true. This is Heather. I was just thinking about the, the time when I was like 13, 14 years old. And I would go to the local public health center here in Boston, Mattapan Community Health Center. You know, I love shouting out to all the local public health centers that, you know, give family planning education. So I would see a black woman by the name of Nina who answered all my questions, provided reproductive health care. And I remember being in like a little classroom with other young black women sitting around the table that had leaflets and pamphlets and, you know, anatomical, like uterus and vaginas on the table were just asking questions and they were answering in a very non-judgmental way. But it was community-based care, you know, that was culturally competent by a provider that looked mm-hmm. like us, right? And so before we could get contraceptives, you had to be educated about it. And I just really appreciated that at that time. But years later, a friend said to me, Oh, I just remember us going down to that, um, you know, to the, to the health center and you were just so responsible about learning about your body and, you know, getting, edu- and, you know, educated about it. I had completely forgotten about it. But when she reminded me of that, I was like, wow, I had to be, you know, proactive about learning my, you know, the history and making these kinds of decisions early on because we weren't getting that kind of education in school. And so, yeah, so I was just thankful for that bit of public health care that that was locally based. Yeah, I'm hearing like from your early childhoods to your parents to now being able to provide those resources and that care to your children. I'm just hearing these strong themes of the disability community and other communities that you're a part of, just the importance of community care and respect and love and providing access for those folks because it's not concrete. and definitely not a given from 
the folks that should be providing those things. So it's really important that we continue to have these conversations with our youth to ensure that they have the proper knowledge to protect themselves and make informed choices and also know that if they have disabilities, that they have the same rights and access and choices to love and care and have sexual relationships and things like that as their non-disabled counterparts. So thank you so much for all of your vulnerability when talking about this. And I wanted to just name that all of these issues that we've gotten to discuss today are incredibly heavy. And I thank you a lot for your honesty when talking about them. And I kind of want to wrap up our conversation with a bit of futurism and hope kind of beyond where we are now and what we've seen in the past. So my question for you, and maybe we can all touch on this before we head out today. What is a liberated future where people with disabilities have full autonomy of their bodies and choices look like to you? And what kind of steps do we need to take to get to that world? This is Brianna Kane. I would say that, truthfully, it's hard for me to envision because it looks completely different than anything that I think any of us have ever envisioned. And I think that it starts from valuing humans, period, regardless mm-hmm. of their quote-unquote mm-hmm. contribution or lack thereof, which it, it is ableist in and of itself in terms of right. whether a person's contribution. It depends on whether they're disabled or not. But the things such as, you know, the I think a lot of things that are well-intended, like the, you know, right to die. Right. Is it really us wanting to die? Or is it people, I mean, or is it people thinking that we should die? Right. Um, and early sterilization or, you know, shaming people for having, you know, sexual desires or needs, and, you know, I uh, or all of those things. I think that it looks like a society when we, where we actually think about the way things are designed right. and processed and who's involved. And that everybody can be, you know, that we're looking out for everyone's needs. Where universal design is not just a a nice phrase, but it's something that we, you know, use as our minimum standard. What do I see the future? I have hope. Like, I have hope. But but it's a hope rooted in reality that the work is exceedingly hard to get people to undo their chosen stupidity, to let go of the rationale that they have for hating how our humanity shows up. That's work. That's, you know, it's like I can't convince a white person mm-hmm. to get over their white fragility if I, if, you know, if their white fragility is based on them needing to be better than me. But I think in terms of where we can go futuristically, even this, we are in the future now with this conversation. This is groundbreaking. And this kind of, this leap forward mm-hmm. of acknowledging that we actually are in reproductive rights fight. And for the kids, it I mean, we, I guess we are the ones we've been waiting for. It's probably the best way that I could say it. And saying that, you know, teaching my daughters, teaching our son, show them their friends seeing us as active parents like Rebecca, like Miranda Key, like Heather, that we, you know, your human condition is not definitive of your humanity. Your humanity is definitive of how you interact, engage, and uplift your mm. community. I think that will be the beauty of it. And once we get rid of people, once we break the psychology of we can only vote for this person because they're here, or we can only do this. Uh, we just have to be the ones that we have to be the agents of change in, the, in order to be um, better. So I'm hopeful because I know the people on this call. This is Rebecca. I want to be Dick Clark. Like I want disabled, all disabled people (laughs) to move about the world with the unencumbered ego and freedom of a rich white man, you know? And I think about when Dick Clark had his stroke and about how, when he came back for New Year's Eve, you saw all the ables on Twitter being like, we don't want to see that dude on TV. Get like, why does he talk like that? Like just the ableism was rampant. Right. And a bunch of us pushed back and we're like, Dick Clark owns New Year's Eve. Mm-hmm. He gets paid whether or not he's there. <laughs> How much do you want to bet that entire set is well, completely designed? On, it's not designed for Seacrest. It's mm-hmm. designed for Dick Clark. <laughs> the production company is called Dick Clark Productions. And the fact that he knew like, he was able to still contribute and he wanted to be there. It was his gig. And he shouldn't have been like, and there's right. no way in hell the network would want to lose. Let's be real. The network wouldn't want to lose the money 
if they fired him and he sued under the ADA, you know, but to think about like what it would be like to move about the world with that freedom, with that, oh, I just go places. And as a disabled person, I don't have to think, of, I don't have to look up ahead of time. Is it accessible? I don't have to look up ahead of time. Does the bathroom have a step? I don't have to, you know, right. plan to be discriminated against by Uber or Lyft on my way out the door. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I can't imagine what that would be like. like this is Heather. Yes. To all of that, where we have to think less about how we move about, you know, a future that is medically accessible, mm-hmm. economically accessible, structurally accessible, and requires far less thought and anxiety and, you know, this internal terrorism, you know, that we have to go through on a daily basis when, you know, planning our day, our lives, our schedules, and how we want that to look like, you know? So I think about all of that. And like Keith, I have hope, even though it seems like a marathon in terms of fighting for our rights and volumizing our needs and the kinds of care we need to live our lives and be a part of a grand mosaic, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I just think about all of those little pieces that construct who we are and how much we are deconstructed by all of these outside factors that are so unnecessarily, but, but also prove very violent, right, to who we are. So that, that, that's my hope is mm-hmm. that all these things eventually come together so that we can move forward as one. It just sounds like a future that's so radically different from where we are now, but that's what it has to be for a society that's built for us, for all of us, and cares for all of us and values all of us. And I think that's such a great and wonderful send off. And again, I appreciate you all being here so much and sharing not just your knowledge, but your lived experiences and your insight with me and our thank listeners. And again, thank you so much for being here today. It was so thank good you. to be in space. Yeah, 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 I love this. I love this. Appreciate this conversation and all of you. Thank you all so much. Thanks again to Heather Watkins, Keith Jones, Marenike Giwa Onaiwu, and Rebecca Coakley for being on the podcast. We really appreciate their vulnerability and care when talking about such an important and timely topic. Indeed. And if you want to learn more about this topic, we will have links to more resources and information about our speakers and the topics in the show notes. All speakers are active on social media and are great leaders in the disability community. Make sure to give them each a follow. Definitely. Also, be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you get notifications about new episodes and stay up to date with our show. We're on all podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Amazon, YouTube, and so much more. You can also find us on our website at disabilityrightsflorida.org forward slash podcast. Stay tuned in the next few weeks for our new series, Voting with a Disability, where we talk to people about election accessibility, voting access, disability voting trends, and more. Thank you for listening to the You First podcast or reading the transcript online. Please email any feedback, questions, or ideas about the show to podcast at disabilityrightsflorida.org. The You First podcast is produced by Disability Rights Florida a not-for-profit corporation working to protect and advance the rights of Floridians with disabilities through advocacy and education. If you or a family member has a disability and feel that your rights have been violated in any way, please contact Disability Rights Florida. You can learn more about the services we provide, explore a vast array of resources on a variety of disability-related topics, and complete an online intake on our website at disabilityrightsflorida.org. You can also call us at 1-800-342-0823. Thank you for listening to You First, the Disability Rights Florida podcast.